Hello and welcome to this special episode of The Peace Frequency. I'm your host, Darren Cambridge. For those of you who are not familiar with The Peace Frequency, it is a podcast series brought to you by the United States Institute of Peace, where we tap into the stories of people across the globe who are making peace possible and finding ways to create a world without violence. You can learn more about The Peace Frequency. Check out previous episodes at thepeacefrequency.com. As you also probably know, this past Monday, Martin Luther King Day was celebrated and recognized throughout the United States. And this, uh, and on Tuesday, we launched a special three episode Facebook Live series exploring the legacy and the strategic insights of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., more specifically the six steps of nonviolent social change, sometimes referred to as the six steps of Kingian nonviolence, um, that King laid out in his 1963 book, Why We Can't Wait. So our three guests for today, our final episode in this series, our guests are David Jensen, who is a veteran of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, a co-creator of the Kingian Nonviolence Curriculum, and chair and founding trustee of the Institute for Human Rights and Responsibilities. So David, I want to thank you for joining us on today's episode. Happy to be here. Second, we will be joined in a little bit by Abdullah Handawi, who is an Egyptian activist and political commentator. So again, just in a, in a few minutes, he'll be joining us. And then third, we're also going to hear from two dialogue experts from USIP, Alison Malofsky and Ariana Barth, both of whom are the main instructors in USIP's online course, Designing Community-Based Dialogue. And then finally, I want to welcome all of our viewers who are tuning in on Facebook Live. We welcome your questions and comments throughout the show. So at any time that you have something that you want to share, you can just type it in the comments section underneath this video. And then two of my colleagues who are here um, off camera, Nick Zaremba and Steven Reuter, they're going to be moderating the conversation. And um, when a question is posed, they're going to let me know and we'll be able to ask it on your behalf. Also, there may be some questions that I asked to our guests, but I'd also love for you all to respond to as well. So we'd like to see that sharing happening um, amongst you all as well. Um, so those of you who've watched the last couple episodes, you know that on Tuesday and Wednesday, I provided a brief overview of what these six steps of nonviolent social change are that King and others championed during the Civil Rights Movement. But as I mentioned, one of our guests was a co-creator of the Kingian Nonviolence Curriculum, uh, worked directly with King and other civil rights leaders in using the strategy uh, towards success in the civil rights movement. So David, I actually want to hand this over to you for today's episode. And could you explain to us what are these six steps of nonviolent social change um, that King articulated and that you and others employed during the civil rights movement? Well, there's, there's two tracks in this story. The first track is that the popular notion by the Fellowship of Reconciliation and most uh, peace groups in the United States uh, in the 1950s was four steps that Gandhi had articulated. And when uh, Dr. Lafayette and I began to analyze Dr. King's books and our experiences with him, we began to see that there were six steps and that uh, one of the things that separates nonviolence from many other, not all, but many other instances of conflict management is the fact that reconciliation is a major step. And that just as in surgery, the surgeon provides sutures and stitches and so on to help heal the wound, mm. the nonviolent movement does the same thing. And we'll illustrate that at some point during the discussion today. But uh, the second thing is that many of the efforts to use nonviolent direct action end at toppling the dictatorship. 
and leave nothing in the way of capacity building to build a new society or a new social order to replace the, uh, the uh, unjust, unjust order. And so Gandhi and King both emphasized the need for this kind of reconciliation step and it kind of took two dimensions. The constructive program, which was building up what ought to be, and secondly, the direct action program, which was more political and confrontational about the issues and framed the issues and formalized them. So we look at the six steps as a methodology and a strategy that, in fact, <laughs> some would say, you could be armed with nonviolence naked in the shower mm. because you have this methodology of six steps in your head and in your heart and in your emotional and psychological being where you can react and respond according to what's required in that moment. And that uh, it doesn't require instrumentalities and extensions and equipment and so on. You have the capacity as a human being to develop this uh, utilization of the six steps. So I'm really excited about it because reconciliation differentiates most of the other methods of conflict management from the six steps. But very quickly, an overview of the six steps are first information gathering which is the quality of the information you start to campaign determines the quality of the outcome. Secondly is the education step, which has also a dual track. One is the development of leadership. And the third and the second is the preparation of the community and the broader society for understanding what's coming. See, very often we'll have people take direct action without any preparation of the society in terms of what to expect from this. And so what we're trying to do is say that 90% of the conflicts can be settled in information gathering and education stage. 10% uh, are going to have to go further in terms of preparation. So the third step is, is what we call um, uh, a personal commitment. Now, there was a time back in the 50s that this was termed largely through a misinterpretation of Gandhi's meaning uh, of self-purification, but that had a very significant self-righteous tone to it. And that was not inconsistent, uh, that was not consistent with the Kingian movement, especially as it developed in Montgomery and then later in Birmingham and so on and so forth. Um, where it became known as long-term preparation. Preparation for the long-term struggle. And we could go into that in quite detail, but we can't do that in this form. Um, the fourth step has to do with negotiation. Now, many people in our society are oriented to negotiation as an adversarial process. In nonviolence, negotiation is where we have to understand the opposition's point of view so that we could almost argue their case better than they can. And different people play different roles in negotiations in the civil rights movement with the Kingian nonviolence philosophy. And it was very important that they have this capacity. In fact, we train people to prepare social drama for negotiation. And at the last minute, we have them switch sides to see if they can, to see if they can argue the other side as articulate as they wanted to argue the proponent's side. Interesting. Uh, so, uh, because we have to help people see that there's a larger understanding going on in negotiation and it's not adversarial, uh, which it also incorporates the fact that all of the six steps are intertwined like the pistons in a V6 engine. They're all firing at the same time. And in negotiation, you're doing information gathering. 
you're doing education. Yes, you're doing uh, personal commitment. You're doing education and negotiation, et cetera, et cetera. So then the fifth step, which is the, um, uh, and the sixth step, which is reconciliation. And the fifth step, which is to understand how to assert yourself in direct action, not in reaction to the opposition, but in response to what the issue is you're concerned about. So the direct action step actually comes uh, in the fifth step of a, of a six step process. And so often we will see people in our society who will have the uh, direct action step, but they skipped over the first four steps. <laughs> and therefore, they don't know why it doesn't work. <laughs> well, they didn't spend any time with their people. I once had an experience, I took a group of ministers concerned about Cuba to a Republican congressman, my Republican congressman at that time, and we were scheduled for a half hour and we spent two hours. And some other very progressive ministers said, how did this happen? How did they get an appointment? Well, they had spent 10 years cursing right. the representative and blaming him for all the problems. And we all know that the history of uh, 50 years with Cuba is, is, is cloaked in all kinds of problems. Uh, but you see, they couldn't communicate uh, with a congressman, and yet, who's your representative in Congress? <laughs> if you don't educate them, if you don't spend time with them, and you don't, you're not able to talk with them. So this group of 10 people learned some very important things. Uh, but then the, finally, the reconciliation step, and that's what's so significant, and we're going to talk further about that as we go along today. But I would have to say that the uh, six steps are the methodology and the strategy of nonviolence uh, and that you can be equipped with the skills and information related to those functions so that you can handle conflict and violent situations. Great. Thank you, David. That was great. I really appreciate you kind of walking us through those steps. And you articulated really well how this is an approach to engage in all types of conflict. It's not just something that if you are part of a nonviolent movement uh, that it's relevant. It's just it, it, personal conflict, all those types of things. I think these steps, as you say, can apply to that, which is really, really helpful. Um, if you can now zoom out for us a little bit and share with us how the Kingian nonviolence curriculum came to be. I've heard a story, perhaps from you, perhaps from some others, that I think on King's last night of his life um, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, he was having a conversation with some of the other organizers and, and activists, obviously, who were part of the movement, and there was a desire to, quote, uh, institutionalize and internationalize what had been learned during the civil rights movement about creating social change, and that that conversation may have been the start of the impetus for, okay, well, how, how do we do that? And I, I, I like that concept because I think in, in many ways USIP is an embodiment of that. Um, these, these principles that you are these steps that you just talked about and how to manage conflict without violence. But could you tell us the Kingian nonviolence curriculum that you and um, Bernard Lafayette have put together and advanced over the, these many years. How did it um, come to be? Well, again, it's a two-track process. First of all, uh, Bernard Lafayette at the time that Dr. King was assassinated was also the national program director and director of the Poor People's Campaign. And that has significance, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit later. But he was leaving a staff meeting in Memphis, flying to Washington, D.C., and Dr. King said to him, Bernard, we have to, our next movement has to be beyond the Poor People's Campaign to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. And by the time Bernard landed in Washington, D.C., 
Dr. King had been assassinated. And so that took things another direction. And the second track has to do with when Bernard Lafayette and I started working as a team in 1964 in the summer, when we made a decision that our job was to what we call leading from the rear. Our job was to develop leadership who could step forth. Now, there were other people on the staff who had more um, interest in media presence and out front charismatic leadership, and those people can be valuable too. But we decided our role was to develop leadership, to train people, to do educational leadership development, and to help these persons, young people, high school students, et cetera, uh, become assertive for the movement. And that way they would be in charge of their own goals. And so the two tracks of that are um, basically, on the one hand, our choice to lead from the rear, and secondly, the decision, uh, the announcement by Martin Luther King that this is what we need to focus on in the future. You see, we wanted people after the assassination to have something to talk about and speak to other than just a, I have a dream speech. While that's important, and the celebration represented by the March on Washington was important, it was not in and of itself a protest march. And we could differentiate between protests and movement and so on and so forth in another venue. But what we wanted to do is make sure people had access to his philosophy and in the six steps, his methodology and his strategy. And also we're not making an icon out of Martin Luther King. He was a leader of an era, and there were many, many people, too many to list right now, uh, who contributed to his development, Reverend Haberdathy's development, the leadership team's development of understanding nonviolence and its application. But the difference is, and this is why Kingian is very important, was that, uh, Martin Luther King was a quick learner and he had poetic skills and he had capacity to speak and articulate things almost beyond the reach of many people. And so he characterized what we call the King era. Mm. And it's funny when we brought out the term King in violence, Lafayette and I uh, you know 30 some years ago, uh, there were people in high places who really kind of objected to that. And we had to point to the book, Strength on Love, after we tried to argue all the rational points of why this was important, to the fact that Martin Luther King himself used the term Kingian in the Strength of Love when he wrote a kind of uh, correlation to uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians Christians, and he said, please forgive me if it sounds more Kingian than Paulinian. Hmm. Well, that pretty much settled it because we said, we thought we were on solid ground to call it Kingian nonviolence without at the same time making an icon out of Martin Luther King. Interesting, fascinating story. Thank you uh, for that. Um, Speaking uh, to folks who want to learn more about Kingian nonviolence, not just more about the six steps, but there's six principles, there's pillars of Kingian nonviolence, there's the history behind it. There is a free webinar that's being offered next week on January 25th, um, and we're going to send a link out uh, through the Facebook feed for those of you who are interested. It's a free 90-minute webinar provided by the organization On Earth Peace, um, one of the best places to go to, to learn more about this. So if you want to dive deeper into the curriculum, into the history, that is a good place to start. Now, uh, David, before uh, Abdallah joins us in a little bit, uh, you talked about King's desire to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier that at least I see, uh, and others, the United States Institute of Peace as part of that vision becoming a reality.
Um, we have a nonviolent action program here at the U.S. Institute of Peace um, that works with folks who are fighting against injustice and oppression all over the world and applying different strategies, learning from each other. So that effort has, has begun. But you also, David, were an integral part and voice in putting together the vision for this institute. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that story? Um, how did the U.S. Institute of Peace come to be? Who were some of the voices and, and actors that put forward this vision um, to make it uh, a substantial part of what uh, the United States seeks to, to represent around the world? Well, it certainly is an exciting story, and my version is not the only version, I'm sure. But I was a graduate student working on my qualifying paper at a cabin 200 miles north of Boston in the winter with eight below zero. And Bernard Lafayette called me, and he had been a board member of the uh, Peace Academy uh, nonprofit group that advocated for it. And he said, David, the Carter administration, based on a bill from Ambassador Young, uh, has appointed a commission and they needed a director or a deputy director. And I can't do it, but I recommended you. Well, 24 hours later, I'm in Washington, D.C., having driven all night and closed up my friend's cabin and all this kind of stuff, and I'm interviewed by the uh, commission chair and the vice chair, um, Senator Spark Matsunaga from Hawaii, and. James Lowey from St. Louis, Missouri, who had worked with Bobby Kennedy, and we knew from the uh, Community Relations Service. <clears throat> but um, I said, when would this start? They said, well, we're going to meet as a commission in the morning. So they called me at 9 and 15 in the morning and said, you've been hired as a deputy director. And um, I said, well, when does this start? They said, yesterday. <laughs> and so on December 20, I'm trying to set up a federal commission with uh, Bill Spencer, my colleague who is chosen as his executive director, during the holidays in Washington, D.C., which was nearly impossible. I think it was six weeks before we got paid. Uh, at any rate, the, the, the short story is that the first thing we did between Christmas and New Year's is gather about 15 people that Bernard Lafayette and I knew as King and Nonviolence organizers or people who were consistent with the values of those organizers to convene for two days and develop a vision of how this commission could be successful. Now, you have to understand that this bill had been introduced to create a National Academy of Peace ever since the George Washington administration. Hmm. And of course, I have mentioned, uh, or I should mention, that many of the characterizations of it was a West Point for peaceniks on the Hudson, which was kind of a hokey idea, and it didn't really pass muster in the Congress. So we decided we had to educate the commissioners as to what broader concepts of institutionalization would be and secondly, we had to bring together people from so many divergent views to debate and discuss this concept. We couldn't just talk to the choir, so to speak. So we envision, instead of traditional congressional hearings, 27 public seminars in all parts of the country. We retained these organizers as, uh, I forget what we call them, associates, um, with a nominal fee of $1,500 to be the organizer of the event in their region and to take the seven questions that the Congress had asked us to respond to, such as, is this trainable? What is the history of this concept, et cetera? And to select people from something we drew from the Kingian nonviolence movement, which was the seven categories of public opinion, now, some people refer to that today as a spectrum of allies, but we had seven categories of public opinion that came from a Catholic layman in the 1850s, according to Gandhi, uh, 
in Ireland that represented on any issue, you would have these seven categories. So we asked these organizers to bring in the people who were dangerous to this idea and what their opinions were, the people who were hostile, the people who were unfriendly, the people who were negatively neutral, the people who were positively neutral, the people who were friendly, and the people who were our friends. So often in the peace movement and the nonviolent movement, people only talk to the choir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they only talk to the 4% of their friends and maybe to the other four or 5% of their friendly, but they don't engage other than in adversarial terms, the opposition. We applied this concept from that we learned in the civil rights movement. So that we had these seven categories as one structure and the seven questions from Congress as the other structure. And we put together public seminars that produced 25,000 pages of testimony. Hmm. And by having people, some of the most conservative people and some of the most progressive people uh, engaged in this process, we created a different kind of dialogue, which we're going to talk about later, yeah. over the question of what should this nation's link be in terms of peacemaking? And so that is uh, how we succeeded. And of course, the final bottom line was 52 senators were co-sponsors of the initial legislation and 137 House members. And it passed with four abstaining votes, I believe, in 1984, and President Reagan signed it. Also interesting is President Reagan's staff had never seen the final report of the commission. I had to give him a copy. Wow, wow, what a great, great story. And totally connected, as you said, to what we want to focus on uh, during today's episode, which is this concept of dialogue, which is a critical peace-building skill uh, that we work on here at USIP is a critical skill in various nonviolent social movements. And the way that I want to grapple with this idea of dialogue, particularly as it pertains to step six and reconciliation, is not just an, an actual dialogue, a community-based dialogue process, but also the principles and elements of dialogue and how those principles and elements of dialogue are also embodied in the, the spirit of, of a nonviolent movement, the, the ways in which we act and behave when we engage in a nonviolent movement. And before I do that, I want to give a nod to our other guest who has, has joined us now, Abdallah Hendawi. Welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. Glad you could be here. Thank you for inviting me. Did you get a chance to ch uh, hear any of the story of USIP that David just shared? I just heard the very last part of, uh, of David's story. Okay, great, great. Well, um, as you probably heard, we're going to jump into the, the focus of today's show, which is dialogue, principles of dialogue, and how they relate to nonviolent social movements. And I actually want to start off with a, a quote from Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which if you have not read, folks who are watching, please read it, please listen to it. It's an amazing um, piece of writing. And the quote goes like this, too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in monologue rather than dialogue, end quote. And so this ties with what you were saying, David, earlier about how too often people want to speak only to those who already agree with them. Um, they want people to be receptive to their monologue and may not be interested in any dialogue. And so taking this quote, when King talks about monologue versus dialogue, what exactly is he talking about? When we're talking about dialogue, what are we talking about? It's a term that I think gets thrown around a lot to describe a lot of different things, many of which are not actually a dialogue or a dialogue process. And so one of the best ways to wrap our heads around what dialogue is to, is to actually contrast it with debate or discussion, forms of communication that we may be more familiar with or more comfortable with. So let's take a look at a video from one of USIP's online courses called Designing Community-Based Dialogue. Um, and this is a video that contrasts dialogue with other forms of communication like debate and discussion. And I think that's gonna provide a nice introduction to all of you watching about what we mean here at USIP when we talk about dialogue. <laughs> 
One of the ways, of the to, ways understand to understand dialogue, dialogue is, to is to compare and contrast it with other, with other engagements around controversial, controversial or divisive or topics, like, topics discussion like discussion or debate. Or debate. Let's first, look, Let's at first look at debate. Think about a debate you have seen or experienced. This could be a presidential debate on television or an informal debate over a meal. What's the goal of a debate? In formal debates, the goal is to win. In informal, conversational debates over controversial issues, the goal might be to convince the person with whom you are speaking or those who are listening that you are right. What is the goal of dialogue? There are different kinds of dialogues that seek different outcomes, but generally, the goal of dialogue is to increase understanding between groups, to find common ground, and improve relationships. There are no winners and losers in dialogue. And because there are no winners and losers, you listen and engage differently. What do you listen for in a debate? If you're trying to win a debate, you might listen for holes, gaps, or weaknesses in the other person's arguments. What do you listen for in dialogue? If you're trying to increase your understanding, you listen for strengths in other perspectives. You listen to be truly informed by what another person says. So how do you do that? Well, it's not easy. It requires active listening and efforts to hear another person as they want to be heard. It requires that you silence your inner monologue, which leads you to analyze and interpret what another person is saying, sometimes forming judgments. It's hard work, and it requires incredible intentionality. You have to want to understand, and you have to be open to the possibility that you can learn from another person. Listening in this way relates to another distinction between dialogue and debate. In debate, there's a tendency to invest in one's own beliefs. Dialogue, however, involves temporarily suspending your beliefs. This idea often poses a challenge for participants in dialogue. How could I possibly suspend my beliefs? That would mean denying who I am and what I hold dear. The idea of suspending one's beliefs is really about acknowledging the various filters through which we see the world. When we listen, information has to pass through our own layers or filters of values and ideologies, etc. So when we invite participants to suspend their beliefs, we're not asking anyone to deny who they are or forget who they are. Rather, we're inviting them to set aside or to open the filters temporarily so we can hear what someone is saying as they want it to be heard. The filters will close again because they're a part of who we are. We've discussed a few of the many distinctions between dialogue and debate. So where does discussion fit? Discussion is somewhere between dialogue and debate. Discussion is a process through which participants share different perspectives, but it does not necessarily involve the deep listening of dialogue. Discussion often involves serial monologuing, in which a number of people share their perspectives on an issue. From this, one might leave a discussion feeling more informed, saying, OK, I understand that there are a number of opinions in the room. I respect all of these opinions, and at the end of the day, we can agree to disagree. Dialogue asks you to dig deeper. In dialogue, you open yourself to the possibility of being truly changed by what someone shares with you. You may leave a dialogue with the same opinion you had when you came, but you leave changed by the encounter with others, by the stories and the lived experiences shared in the dialogue space. Unlike debate or other intellectual endeavors, dialogue invites emotion and experience. Dialogue moves you out of the cerebral space of facts and arguments and asks you to see the humanity in others, connecting through empathy. Great. So that was one of our videos from USIP's online course, Designing Community-Based Dialogues. And now I want to turn to you, Abdullah. Um, first, give us all a little bit of a background of yourself. You identify as an Egyptian activist. Um, I'd love to hear when you gave yourself that identity, or you feel like you could identify as an activist. Was there a specific experience where you, you started wearing um, that label? And then the second question is, based off of what we just heard about what dialogue is, how it's different from debate and discussion, and what the experience is like having been part of a dialogue, is dialogue something that, as an activist, you feel like you've actually been a part of? Well, so 
A couple of things here. First, I mean, usually the title or the label of an activist is um, is 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 a tricky part because you don't know where your activism really starts and where it ends and if it will end or not. Um, my understanding of activism is really committing big part, big chunk of your time to help uh, commit your time to help your cause, um, to fight for something you believe in. Um, I mean, when I fought, but by say fighting, I mean the nonviolent fight, of course, and the idea of committing your your time to a cause. But here's here is the thing. I mean, now we're talking a lot about dialogue, which is an extremely important part of, of activism. When when we talk about dialogue, um, especially in this line of political activism, dialogue is really uh, overshadowed. Unfortunately, many parts of, uh, um, I would say many activists uh, in many parts of the world do not really engage in dialogue um, when they should. Uh, I think there is a stage, at least in, in my experience back in, in, in Egypt when we started the revolution back in 2011, there was a time where we were talking at each other. We were not just engaging in dialogue. We were, there was no constructive um, uh, agenda in where do we want our activism to, to go. Um, if we had understood or valued the, uh, the, the, the value of, of dialogue at the time, maybe we would have a better chance. Um, but I think many of the Arab Spring revolutions have missed uh, valuing and appreciating um, dialogue per se. Did we discuss? Yes, we did. We discussed a lot. We have thought a lot. We talked a lot. But mainly, we weren't really talking um, to discuss future or engage in constructive debates. Unfortunately, and, and this is self-criticism to many activists in, um, who were taking part in the Arab Spring. We weren't engaging in dialogue uh, as it should be. We weren't listening to each other. We weren't. We were not um, looking at a future in which every one of us is taking part of it. Many of the political parties, including activists, maybe because of the lack of experience, maybe because of their own agendas, maybe for political aspiration, despite the, the the reason, they still, at the end of the day, did not engage in dialogue as as it should be, and thus. We are seeing lots of um, of backlashes against these um, uh, activist movements uh, in, in the region. Interesting. David, what about you? Reflecting on your experience in the U.S. civil rights movement and the work that you've done with other movements, campaigns, and activists around the world, is dialogue, uh, as it's defined in this video, something that movements experience, whether it be within the movement itself, um, across various allied actors, or between the movement and their opponents? Absolutely. Um, one of the things in the King and Nonviolence course is uh, we teach about the fact that uh, Martin Luther King and others in the movement were Hegelian in their philosophical orientation. And that is that they were dialectical. And that uh, Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had a research committee that met monthly over 15 years in New York City. And during that set of deliberations, there were 10 or 15 people that were part of all of these conversations who differed greatly on every issue. And Dr. King's position was to sit on the side of the conversation and listen. And he would try to identify the different truths that are on this continuum between the dialectical process of the thesis and the antithesis. And then at a certain point, he would raise the fact that we should analyze this particular truth because in this situation, it's a truth, and we should look at it and understand it better. And from that, they would develop a synthesis of the thesis and the antithesis and the analysis, which became the nonviolent solution to this problem. For example, it wasn't just an issue of voting rights. It was an issue of the right to participate in government and framing it that way <coughs> provided a very different uh, characterization for the public, for government, that if you couldn't guarantee the right 
to participate in government, how could you be a democratic society? And so uh, this Hegelian process was very important. The second thing is uh, this concept, interestingly enough, has become the most important learnable concept by teenagers being awaiting trial for murder as adults in U.S. prisons. When they learn this skill of analyzing conflict and analyzing problems from the dialectical point of view, they conclude that they wouldn't have ended up committing murder if they had understood how to do this before. So uh, there are a great many uh, examples in the civil rights movement, the human rights movement, of uh, how this was adapted to the street level by people to look at and listen to the various truths in the situation and select those that, that were most uh, present in, in the situation of injustice. Great, great. So it's absolute. Excellent, excellent. So there were a couple things that Allison talked about in the video that strike at the kind of spirit of dialogue, the elements of dialogue that people are asked to embrace and embody if they want to participate in, in a dialogue process. And I want to touch on a couple of them, dive deeper on a couple of them, and I want to provide an analogy to uh, kind of prompt some discussion. And so one of the first concepts that she brings up is this idea that dialogue seeks to find common ground amongst the parties who are part of that process. And the analogy that I like to use that for some of you are probably familiar with is the analogy of the elephant and the four blind people. And the way the analogy works is that you have four blind individuals and they're each, each asked to approach this thing that is in front of them. So the first person walks up and approaches um, the elephant and touches uh, the tail. And when they're asked, what is it that is in front of you, that person says, well, it's a broom. Uh, the second person walks up to the elephant and uh, touches the ear, and they're asked, what is it that is in front of you? And they say, oh, well, no, it's a giant, thick piece of paper. Um, that's what's in front of us. The third person approaches the elephant and touches the leg and says, no, what's in front of us is a giant tree trunk. And then the fourth person approaches the elephant and they're asked, what is it that is in front of you? And they touch the trunk and they say, no, it's a giant snake. That's what's in front of us. So they're all touching the same thing, but they're feeling and experiencing something very different. And in dialogue, it's oftentimes referred to as a process or a conversation with a center as opposed to with sides. And if these individuals can communicate, they can realize that, yes, it's the same thing that we're touching, but we're experiencing it in a variety and feeling a lot of different things from this. And conflict is very much the same way, that people approach it and touch it in different ways so that they're, what they feel and what they experience from that conflict is fundamentally different from somebody else who is actually touching the same, the same thing. And so how can a conversation, and in this case a dialogue, be used to help people see the entire elephant as opposed to only the parts that they are able to, to touch? So Abdullah, I want to turn to you using this analogy and this concept of finding common ground that in your experience as an Egyptian activist, being part of the revolution, and then everything that has followed since then, um, when it comes to the conflict in Egypt, are there new perspectives that you've come to learn over the years to get a fuller picture of the conflict? So the thing is, I agree entirely on bringing up this excellent example, uh, the elephant in the room, but the thing is that when, with, with many millions in the street, um, many of them are sporadic. The whole movement becomes continuous, and the critical mass that once mobilized the movement uh, becomes only uh, an elite for them. And, and so you see that there is a gap between the leadership of, of the movement and the actual constituency in the street, the protesters, the people who have a certain grievance or an injustice. And, and it is very difficult for these people to get together with them and convince them that they have to see 
the whole side of the elephant and the center of the concept. It, it is a very exhausting process, especially that at the same time you're trying to communicate with your constituency, you're also trying to negotiate other alliances and partnerships in, in the society, and also trying to fight a battle with the ruling um, uh, uh, regime or an elite or your opponent, no matter who is it. So it becomes a very, very exhausting process. What do we learn from that? I mean, obviously, how many revolutions do we have to go through in our lives? It's it's not something that you would do every year or every uh, every end of of a quarter. So, what do we learn here is that there 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 is there are there are more efforts that has to be. Um, exerted in, in public education, in particularly about the ideas of, of listening to the other, because every one of us, as, as you eloquently explained, every one of us saw only one angle of, of the story. We didn't have the whole story. There was no information available. There was no uh, space available for us to talk. The only space was available for us to talk was only that Tahrir Square in, in, in Cairo. And that is a pretty small space, considering the fact that we had so many topics to cover. It was very shortage of time. There were many things that we had to talk about. We simply didn't have a chance. There were other powers that were more organized than us who were able to seize um, a chance and were able to, uh, I wouldn't call, use the word hijacking the revolution or hijacking activism, but I would say that they made excellent use of it for their own, uh, for, for their own interest. Now, to go back to your question, what do we learn from that? I think, again, we have to exert more efforts in, in, in understanding. We have to um, put a lot of efforts in, 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 in really reversing the process of polarization that happens in society, in, in mass mobilization, in, 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 in cases where a whole country or a whole society is mobilized on something. It is always expected to see this uh, case of, of extreme polarization uh, and, and labeling, and it's either white or black. You're either with me or, or against me, and tensions arise. And if people do not really see dialogue as the only way to go, then it can turn into a violent scene. And, and unfortunately, that's what we see now in many of the post-Arab Spring uh, societies. The violence has prevailed to a big extent because people ditched uh, dialogue again. It was not their choice. It was the way um, things things flowed. And so, had we exerted more efforts in trusting each other, in building better alliances and partnerships within uh, within the society, if we had had more chance to collect better information about our opponents, if we had better chance to understand our future, our agenda, our plan for the future, building this is an important thing. Also, building a, a political alternative. Um, what many many of the social movements nowadays have a problem is that they they know how to oppose uh, a certain actor, whether a state or a non-state actors. But unfortunately, not all of them do have uh, the ability to provide an alternative, at least an alternative vision to how to how to proceed forward. And and that's what many activists and and and, and movements fall into the, the not able to articulate an alternative vision for the future. So if we have had these elements. Uh, prior to 2011, I think we would have a better, uh, better chance. Yeah, yeah. So, David, you know, I think the challenge that Abdullah has articulated for us is not unique to Egypt or the Arab Spring or this moment in history. It's probably a challenge that's been shared by many movements. And when we're talking about dialogue, bringing together um, various individuals, actors, perspectives to a conflict, parties to a conflict. Amidst all the other things that are going on, all the other emotions, all the other uh, things that are required of movement organizers, it's really difficult. And so, in your experience, um, again, through the civil rights movement, working with other movements, how can movements overcome some of these challenges and barriers to actually being able to bring together people in a space that allows for dialogue to actually occur? Well, I think— um this has been a very good description of the dilemma that many movements face. Um, the civil rights movement faced this as well. And in fact, what they refer to as the Rashoon effect, the story of the elephant, uh, was what prompted uh, Lafayette and I to put a module in the training curriculum called Framing the Issue. Because who frames the issue determines two things. One is the context for dialogue, and secondly, 
who can support your issue. And so framing the issue rather than voting rights, but guaranteeing the right to participate in government changed a whole society's perception of what a democratic society should be. But we had, as a movement, to take that responsibility. So I would say that the most important thing is to learn how to reframe the issue so that you have a uh, broad enough context in which to have dialogue. And secondly, that you can attract a broad base of support because people believe that what you're doing is at the heart of what's in the interest of the country and the society. Mm -hmm. Mm, thank you. Another thing that Allison mentioned in the video is this idea of suspension, uh, mm -hmm. suspending our beliefs. And an analogy that I, I like to use when it comes to this concept of suspension is uh, a, a sword and a shield. And I think our opinions, our beliefs, our assumptions are oftentimes used as swords or shields, are used as weapons to try and defeat and attack a, an opinion that is different than ours that somebody else holds, or it's used as a shield to protect ourselves from another differing opinion that is in some way trying to dismantle our own. And so we have these beliefs, assumptions, they're very much part of our identity, but we are trained in many ways, are used to using them as shields and as swords and as weapons. And in a dialogue process, and this idea of suspension is, we're not asking people to pretend like they don't have a shield and they don't have a sword, um, and that they don't have opinions, beliefs, or assumptions, and let go of their whole identity, but instead it's saying, you have your shield, you have your sword, but let's just lay them down on the ground, all of us together in this dialogue process. Lay down your shield, lay down your sword, um, and let's observe uh, and look at each other's swords and each other's shields uh, together um, with one another. Um, your shield looks like this. Your sword is this length. It has this type of handle. It has this type of cut or chisel in it. Your shield has this type of emblem on it. But we are experiencing the swords and shields of other people, not as weapons that we're trying to overcome or defeat um, or that we feel threatened by. Um, we're just simply observing them. And when the dialogue is over, we can pick them back up and, and use them as we will, but at least that space was provided to lay down that sword, lay down that shield, and observe them alongside those of others. Um, so what kind of work needs to be done for members of a movement to be able to do something like this? Um, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work has to go into um, not only providing that space, um, but then getting people in the right mindset to feel comfortable to actually put down or suspend, rather, their opinions, assumptions, and beliefs and not feel like they need to be um, defended or used to attack another person's. Were there elements of this at play in the civil rights movement, David? What did those spaces look like that provided that um, container, that atmosphere that made people feel comfortable that they are able to, at least for this moment, suspend their beliefs, assumptions, um, and opinions? Well, very much so. Uh, it was very present. Uh, different modalities of nonviolence have different language uh, to describe this. Uh, our description in the Kingian Nonviolence Curriculum is doubt your first conclusion. That's the way we do the suspension process. Maybe I'm wrong. And maybe I could learn something about what the whole picture is like if I listen and probe and dialogue with you. So um, it was very, very present. And I wish we had time to give the number of illustrations there are uh, that actually were instrumental in the formation of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Because I remember Ambassador Young describing the negotiations that took place at five in the morning at a back door of an old guy's house in Charleston, South Carolina during the 1199 movement for health workers after Dr. King was assassinated. And that was where the real negotiations took place. And that was where they worked out the nuances of 
down in your first conclusion and what might be acceptable to the leadership of the community, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is one of the exciting parts of nonviolence for me is that we have to challenge our assumptions. Uh, it doesn't mean we abandon them. It just means we have to challenge and think through and probe deeper. Uh, we have a, a concept of differentiation in nonviolence where we have to look at the difference, and I mentioned framing the issue, where we separate the symptoms from the core. It's like peeling an onion to get to the core. And we have to go through that process and we can't do that if we don't suspend or doubt our first conclusion um, because our first conclusion might be totally erroneous. Yeah, yeah. Let's turn now to one of our viewers on Facebook who has a question. Uh, Nick, who do we have? Yes, we have a question from Sarah who asks, um, in the process of mobilizing those who are experiencing the quote, elephant in different ways, how do you coordinate all the different groups who come with differing levels of power, strengths, needs, and perspectives. The need for intentionality in organizing groups and leveraging, leveraging the diversity seems tricky in this context. Yeah, Abdullah, can we turn to you to address this question? Can you take us to Tahrir? Because as you said, this is one of the few places where a diverse group of individuals could come together and have these conversations and potentially experience dialogue in some form. Um, what was that like in Tahrir to address her question? So I think there were two elements in that sense. First, the common cause. Second, the common space. The common cause, basically, the people, I mean, the social movements emerge when there is a common sense of injustice or grievance towards one thing, and that's how it worked in many of the Arab Spring countries, uh, countries that movements were brought together for one fair cause, and that fair cause was political change, social justice, many of the basic needs that many people uh, were looking for. So first, many people, even those who were not politicized, even those who did not have a political affiliation or a history of activism or a history history of resistance or anything. I mean, everyone wanted to live a decent life. Everyone was angry. Everyone was upset. And that was the main motive that we had to play on. We, we didn't approach, I mean, activists in general did not approach a socialist group or a leftist group or an Islamist group, and we told them, like, let's sit together and talk about anything. No, we, we basically, it was basically very spontaneous. We had to address the needs, the concerns, the grievances that these people have, not really their ideological backgrounds. And despite if you're an Islamist or you're a liberal, everyone suffered in, in, in Egypt. Everyone suffered uh, the, the political arrest, the, the uh, murder, the torture. The, everyone suffered the same thing. So if we all have the same fair cause, then let's talk about it. Let's get together for that. And the second thing was the common space. We started to create spaces. Back in 2011, the primary space was not just the Harrier Square at the time, but also was the online sphere. We were blogging a lot. I remember using Boxpot and, and MySpace as an important uh, platform for, for discussions. It was not uh, that available at the time. It was not as common as it is today. But at that time, it was, it was a big deal. It was something that, that we've been looking forward to. And it represented, it had represented a chance for us. So many people were going there to vlog and to talk. The government was not as much active as in this online space as it is now. So we had an opportunity to um, to do that. So the fair cause, the, the common space, and then the third one, uh, I would say, was the plan forward. So what are we going to do about that? And when people see that they all share something and then they have a space to do something, and then there is a plan to commit an action, to take an action towards this grievance, they join. They join despite their own ideological differences or challenges or, or, or threats or risks that they, they may face. Uh, it's challenging, it's difficult, it's not easy, but it could happen, it's possible. That's great. We're coming to the end of our time here, but I, I don't want to end our conversation until we touch on this concept of the beloved community, which is something that King talked about time and time again, wrote about time and time again, was a critical part of the civil rights movement, and how it's tied to this concept of humanity, because that's another governing principle of, of dialogue, is this concept of humanity. So I want to end our show um, with a King quote, another short video from Ariana Barth, one of the, again, main instructors in the um, designing community-based dialogue course that we have here. So I'll start with the King quote, and King said that, quote, an individual—
has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. And so this means that we must be able to see the humanity in others in order to comprehend their concerns. So let's take a look at this video from Ariana to get a deeper dive into this co complex concept of humanity. One of the critical problems that dialogue addresses is that we may learn from a very young age that those who are different from us are somehow inferior. We are exposed to overt and subtle messages that people who look, think, speak, pray, and act differently than we do are less than fully human. One of the goals of dialogue is to ask people to critically reflect on how we view other people, and if we can, to use that information to change how we treat them. In dialogue, we also identify and explore messages we've received that put our own humanity into question. The governing principle of humanity dictates that empathy must be part of the dialogue process. When we hear an opinion or an experience from another participant that doesn't align with our worldview, instead of rejecting it, we are asked to try and understand where it came from. Empathy is the act of seeing the world through another person's frame of reference. By emphasizing empathy in the dialogue process, our hope is that people will begin to see others as equally human. A problem comes about, however, when there are unequal power dynamics in a dialogue. Sometimes in a conflict context, one group's humanity has historically not been questioned by society, while another group's humanity is constantly put into question. To go into dialogue, then, and ask both sides to see the humanity in the other can feel unjust. This is something facilitators should be prepared to address. Um, and I, I've said this a couple times now as we've had our conversation, that a lot of these things, uh, these concepts, are hard work for people, particularly when you're in context of extreme violence or conflict, oppression, injustice. This concept of uh, suspending one's beliefs and assumptions, um, this idea of empathy and trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand their frame of reference. It's very, very difficult, but also an essential part of creating what King referred to as the beloved community. And I bring this full circle because a lot of that is what we do here at USIP, is what are those skills? How can people be trained? How can they develop a practice so that we have the capacity to engage in a dialogue process? We have the capacity to engage in a negotiation with a counterpart in a way that leads to positive outcomes for all parties. How do we uh, teach ourselves, prepare ourselves to see the humanity in somebody else or another group? So David, I want to start with you um, to share with us what is this concept of the beloved community? And then Abdullah, we'll end with you to hear about what are some ways in which you have been able to practice over these last few years to see the humanity in other people that you fundamentally disagree with, that you may see or had seen as, as oppressors, but what are the skills that you have to um, um, draw on um, to be able to see that humanity? So, David, let's start with you, the beloved community. What is this concept? What does it mean? Such an important concept and so integral to the practice of nonviolence. The love community is to recognize that the nonviolent concept is an overall effort to achieve a reconciled world by raising the level of relationships among people to a height where justice prevails and persons attain their full human potential. This involves a, a constructive program and a direct action program, b, an understanding of the ends and means concept, uh, confronting social change advocates, and C, to relate the intrinsic values of nonviolence to one's own faith and to the concept of one's personality and community. These are contextualized by a larger frame, which first deals with injustice, 
and second, producing a positive force in society to prevent the problem from ever reoccurring. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And so Abdallah, this concept of the beloved community, um, and thinking about your experience in the Egyptian context, um, my first question was, when do you feel you've been able to develop those skill sets, that mindset to actually start seeing the humanity in, in other people that maybe at one time you didn't? And then also, what's the path forward for creating this sense of the beloved community, particularly in Egypt? I think a conversation with one of the um, uh, law enforcement in Egypt who was tasked uh, and assigned to disperse uh, our demonstration was the key in that. Um, I had a long conversation with him. Um, he, and I believe he was really sincere about doing his job. He thought social movements are evil. He thought all activists are bad people and that they're here just to destabilize the country and to undermine its national security. Um, I mean, it's obvious he, he believes in it, and I believe in what I'm doing. He's not a bad guy. I'm not, I believe I'm not a bad guy. Uh, and one thing I learned at that time is to put myself in his shoe and try to understand and try to think the way he does. Uh, what is his background? How did he grow up? What is the kind of education he received? And what kind of indoctrination did he receive in the law enforcement institutions in, in, in Egypt and, and, and these similar countries? And when I do, I start to understand why is he behaving the way he does and why he believes that democracy is not the best solution and why that uh, activist could really represent a threat to him and his, his institution. And when I start to think this way, I start to understand why is he acting this way? And I started to even think that, well, to oppose him, there is no way that we take this fight to the street and, and, and that we would expose our muscles to each other and just see who is going to do better demonstration than the other. In fact, this reversal has to happen in, in education. It has to happen in more compassion, more empathy, and more trust to each other, and, and try to understand why do we behave the way we do and why the other behave the way they, they do. And as the video explained, just because someone acts differently doesn't make him less of a human being. And the same, even though law enforcement or police or the dictatorial regimes are essentially bad, in my opinion, um, I think the, nobody is born bad, nobody is born evil, <laughs> nobody is born to kill the other. They, they have gone through an experience, just as I did, and the only difference is that their experience was different than mine, and that's why it produced two different human beings with two different causes, and that's to reverse that process. We have to go beyond that. We have to go to the root causes and understand that and reverse that if we really want to have faith in this community and, and to have faith in the good being in this community. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. Abdullah, thank you so much for joining us and sharing aspects of, of your story. And David, thank you so much also for sharing um, aspects of your story and your expertise. Um, I think it was a great way to kind of end this um, special Facebook Live series of, of the Peace Frequency podcast. And I also want to thank all of you who tuned in on Facebook um, today and in other parts of the series. Um, you have been listening to, watching the Peace Frequency, which is a podcast series brought to you by the United States Institute of Peace where we bring together and we tap into the stories of people across the globe who are making peace possible and finding ways to create a world without violence. You can learn more about The Peace Frequency at thepeacefrequency.com. I have been your host, and you can go to that website to see previous episodes um, from over the years um, and, and hear some other amazing stories. Uh, until then, keep building, supporting, and learning. Peace.